So we invited um, uh, a number of people who uh, are not um, full-time AMP Lab members, but are, uh, we like to think of them as honorary AMP Lab members who've helped us out in, in a number of different ways. And so uh, we've invited them to come here and uh, give us a little bit of their perspective on uh, the big data and machine learning and analytics um, ecosystems and industries. And you know, of course, if they want to say anything nice about AMP Lab, we won't complain. Um, so we're going to get started there. Um, our first speaker uh, in this session is, is uh, uh, ben Lorica, uh, who's the chief data scientist at O'Reilly. Uh, he was uh, a very early uh, adopter and um, proponent of, of Spark and uh, helped us uh, really throughout the project in terms of engaging uh, with practitioners and people in the industry. Uh, ben actually has the Twitter handle, at Big Data, um, which tells you either he's incredibly well connected or he just uh, saw things happening before a lot of other people, but uh, um, I'm gonna let, turn it over to Ben, thanks. Thank you, Mike and Ian, for the opportunity to speak today. Um, uh, many of you probably know me for uh, organizing a bunch of events. So I'm, uh, I run the program for two uh, big O'Reilly conferences, uh, one on big data and data science called Strata Plus Hadoop World, and uh, our partners, uh, Claudera, Mike Olson, is here today to speak right after me. And uh, we just uh, started a new event series uh, focused on AI. So, so uh, many of the things that uh, I'll talk about are informed by me organizing many events, uh, meeting people from across the world, engaging them at the conference level. But uh, also O'Reilly has long been uh, a content leader in uh, technology. So now, nowadays we have a subscription platform called Safari, but uh, we also continue to publish blogs, uh, we have podcasts and, uh, and continue to uh, publish technical books. So uh, a lot of what I'm gonna say is informed by uh, you know, wearing that conference hat and I'm also responsible, uh, in, inside O'Reilly I'm in responsible for all the content that has to do with data and AI. So I'm gonna start by just kind of uh, reminiscing about the early days of Spark and AMP Lab. Um, so I'll start around probably like 2008, 2009. So uh, uh, I was part of a group here in the Bay Area that started to coalesce around this term data scientist. Um, so back then, at least in the early days, uh, you know, we had, we didn't really have many, uh, uh, oh, we didn't have a single tool really to, to uh, uh, do our entire workflow. So uh, me, myself, personally, at O'Reilly, we were the first users of a system called Greenplum. Um, and then when Hadoop came out, we, you know, we started to use that. Um, but that really only covered part of what we needed to do, so then we had to use a bunch of other things, right? So like everyone else at that time. Um, and so then, I don't know exactly when I heard about Spark, but I was drawn immediately to, to it, mainly because it was fast. So that was the first thing that I liked about it. So the, the part about Scala, to be honest, I wasn't that uh, crazy about Scala <laughs> in, in the early days, but uh, now I'm a, I'm a big Scala fan. Um, so what, what I liked about it, at least in the beginning, was that it reduced the number of things I had to use so I could uh, uh, focus on solving problems rather than uh, documenting steps and uh, documenting uh, uh, what tools I was using. So it really uh, allowed me to be much more productive. Um, and then ar around, I, I think it, this was, I guess, mid-2012, uh, there was a meetup that I don't know how many people remember. I see Alexi here, he was definitely at this meetup. Um, this took place at Yelp. This was, I think, the first time that AmpLab talked about uh, Spark streaming. Um, it wasn't actually available at the time. And uh, what struck me was uh, just the questions from the audience and the uh, reaction, right? So at that time, most people were using Storm. Um, so generally, you would sense right away that 
uh, if and when this Spark streaming got released, it was gonna be adopted widely, right? So people were really dying to try it right uh, off, the, off the bat. Um, so I knew then that uh, Spark was probably gonna be much more than just uh, uh, tools that data scientists were gonna use, right? So it's, it will be used by uh, people in infrastructure as well. So actually that meetup was uh, interesting for another reason because it was at that meetup that I convinced Matei to work on a book which eventually became one of our uh, better selling books called Learning Spark. So then a few months later, the first AMP camp, which wasn't here, it was in another building near the computer science department. So a few things to that at that first AMP camp. First, uh, Python. So, of course, after they forced us to learn Scala, they announced at this first AMP camp that they were gonna now support Python. And it turned out that was a, a, a right decision, right? So as you can see, uh, this is a recent survey from Databricks. Uh, the number of people now using uh, the Python API pretty much matches uh, the number of people using Scala. So we, are, we at O'Reilly run an annual survey of data scientists and data engineers. And uh, if you look more broadly at the, uh, that community, not just people who use Spark, so Python is also widely used, right? So about half the people in, in our annual surveys use Python. And recently, actually, I, I uh, took a peek at our search logs. So this is for O'Reilly's uh, many web properties, and I tried to find out uh, uh, what languages were popular. Uh, as you can see, Python, right? So that uh, decision to go to Python early uh, uh, was a great one by AMP, AMP Lab. Secondly, the cloud. Uh, so, that first AMP camp, uh, all the tutorials were done on AWS. So uh, right away, I think uh, I think uh, the AMP lab themselves did most of their research work on Amazon. So most of the documentation was uh, uh, geared towards helping you get started using all their tools on Amazon. So again, another big uh, uh, bet and a good call. So third thing about that first AMP camp was uh, uh, machine learning. So there were a few sessions on machine learning, which was uh, what drew me to Spark. And it was good for me to hear that uh, uh, there were many other people in the audience who were uh, uh, using Spark for machine learning. But uh, let's face it, at, at that time, it was definitely the early days of machine learning in Spark. There was actually I don't think there were any libraries. There were a few examples that they shipped. So it was definitely roll your own, right? So you wanted to uh, uh, use a certain algorithm. It didn't really exist. So it was good in the way that you were forced to actually learn Spark, but you know, also uh, not so good because you, know, you had so many people rewriting the same libraries again and again. Um, but even very early, I noticed that the Spark community and AMP Lab knew that uh, they didn't really have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, there were other machine learning libraries out there. And uh, the general philosophy has always remained the same. Um, if you have a tool that you like, you should use it if it fits in one machine. If it doesn't, uh, you can still use Spark uh, to run that favorite tool across a cluster. So in our uh, most recent survey, we found that uh, while MLlib is not the most popular tool, it's the second most popular tool, but also uh, uh, we found that most people who actually use these other tools still use Spark, right? Because you still need some tool uh, to do your uh, pre-processing to fit your data into a single machine. So, after uh, that first AMP camp, we started conversations with uh, Mike and uh, we actually brought AMP camp into Strata. And then at some point we renamed it into Spark camp because we realized that uh, most people were actually interested in Spark, not the other. I don't know if you guys remember, AMP camp tends to be more uh, tutorials on everything that AMP lab does, uh, all the different libraries. So, at least from our perspective, the main uh, uh, focus for our audience tended to be Spark. 
So uh, with our partners, Cloudera and a bunch of other companies, uh, since we started offering uh, Spark tutorials and training, so this ranged from half day to two days, we have now trained over 4,000 people in person, right? So this is in person, not online. And with Databricks, we started a few years ago offering a certification program in, in uh, Spark, and so we have now certified. So over 700 people have passed the certification exam. Uh, so again, in our, according to our most recent survey at least, uh, Spark has now emerged as the most popular tool in this uh, big data ecosystem. But AmpLab has always been more about Spark, and we recognize that. So at O'Reilly, so I've personally written about many of these projects. We've had talks at, uh, at our conferences about uh, many of these projects, and, uh, and I, I think uh, you'll hear more, at least, about Aluxio, and uh, I'm not sure if these other projects are going to be represented in the program, but uh, we're big fans of a lot of these projects that came out of AmpLab. All right, so now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about some of the other things that uh, we're noticing at O'Reilly. Um, so some of this might be related to, to what AmpLab is doing, some uh, won't be. So first, um, uh, deep learning. So a couple of data points. One, uh, we're starting to run a deep learning training at some of our events, so, so they sell out, right? So uh, people are hungry to learn about this uh, new machine learning technique. So when I say data scientists, I literally mean data scientists who are not experts in deep learning. So these are people who use uh, other machine learning techniques. Uh, so what we also notice is that every time we publish anything on deep learning, uh, it just generates a lot of uh, traffic. Um, and this is not true only in the U.S., because uh, we do translate many of our articles into Chinese, and uh, the most popular uh, articles recently, at least, are, have to do with deep learning. So lots of libraries, uh, and I think there will be more than one library. I think people are uh, interested a lot these days in TensorFlow, but I do think that there will be several libraries. Um, and the Spark community has already kind of recognized that, that they have to support deep learning, so uh, Databricks has made deep learning available on their platform, but uh, just yesterday I was at uh, an Intel AI event and they made an announcement that uh, they're gonna open source something called Big DL on Spark uh, early next year. So we took a stab at uh, understanding uh, who's using deep learning. Uh, we, we did the crawl of the internet. So we found a few hundred companies. Uh, some are using it in production, some are just playing around with it. Um, and it, at this point, it tends to skew towards uh, uh, slightly larger companies, right? So. Secondly, uh, streaming data. So again, so this is mostly informed by uh, what I'm seeing at our events. So, so here I'm just taking kind of the point of view that uh, the, of streaming rather than the whole real-time, low-latency uh, systems, right? So, could be. So it turns out that at least most of the people I talk to operate in this realm of near real-time. So streaming is probably the right ad adjective more than uh, real time. So one of the things we've noticed is that um, uh, while most of the people who engage in this unbounded data sets tend to be more on the developer engineering side, there is a grow growing cohort of people uh, more on the machine learning and uh, business analytics side who want to use and are starting to use uh, unbounded data sets. So I think part of it is just accessibility. So a lot of the tools tend to be uh, aimed at people who deal with engineering and infrastructure. Uh, so one uh, good sign here is that the Spark community at least is attempting to open up streaming to a broader population, right? So using this new structured streaming API. So I... Uh, 
talent shortage has always been framed around data scientists, and we think uh, that's still the case, but uh, we're also hearing from many people who think uh, uh, there's a need for data scientists who have slightly better software engineering skills. So as data science goes into production, um, I, I think uh, we're, at least uh, in our conversations with people, they, they, want, uh, they want a cohort of data scientists who can actually touch production systems, so slightly better software engineering skills. I think Jupyter Notebooks are great, but uh, I don't know many people who deploy Jupyter Notebooks in production. So the cloud, uh, as you know, growing, uh, the public cloud providers continue to grow at an uh, incredible rate. So we've always taken the view that we're the Switzerland of uh, technology, so we have a mix of uh, uh, technologies at our events and in our uh, uh, publishing platforms. So they include open source. Increasingly, we're, we're being asked to do more around uh, uh, these managed services in the cloud. Um, and part of it, I think, is if you drill down and if you uh, talk to companies who are going to deploy uh, uh, applications in the cloud, there's really a lot of uh, reasons why you might want to go with these managed services, right? So they're probably cheaper, you let, need le less people, and they provide you with a lot of uh, uh, free things that you, you would have to deal with if you had to uh, hire infrastructure engineers to uh, run this for you. But uh, the reality is, as you guys know, there will be a mix of solutions. There will be uh, uh, hybrid solutions of on-prem, on cloud, and there's all also going to be uh, specialized cloud providers. So Josh here, who, who's now at GE, can talk to you about Predix, which is a uh, cloud for uh, the industrial internet that GE runs. But uh, one thing that I, I do know is that uh, even in this world of managed services and cloud computing, Spark seems to be uh, something that's gonna persist. So it seems like the Spark API is widespread enough, the community of developers is broad enough, that uh, the cloud providers always send me emails to remind me how, uh, how well they support Spark, right? So I'm not worried about Spark in this, uh, in this new world of managed services. So let me reframe the skills gap then slightly. So we, we are uh, at least being asked to provide training more and more for engineers who are also savvy with this new world of uh, cloud computing. So a pattern that many in the big data world notice early on, and obviously AmpLab did as well, is this decoupling of storage and computation. I think this afternoon you'll hear more about Aluxia, which is emerging to be that common memory layer, shared memory layer for big data. It's a storage-backed shared memory layer. But uh, even in the deep learning world, you're starting to see uh, uh, deep uh, neural networks with access to external memory. So data applications are getting easier to build. Again, the cloud has uh, uh, a lot to do with this. So this is a slide I chose from Mike's uh, f uh, first AMP camp. Uh, as you can see, he probably drew this himself. <laughs> um, but uh, back, in, back in those days, at least, uh, I think uh, uh, many of us thought about things in terms of stacks, right, so, and, and platforms, right? So what is your platform, what is your stack? Uh, increasingly now, I think if you talk to people, they wanna talk in terms of applications and how do I compose these different components to build end-to-end -end solutions? So rather than kind of the stack perspective, they want kind of the, uh, uh, pipeline or workflow perspective, right? So how do I go from source data to application? How do, so in this case, for example, I, I stole this uh, slide from Chi Lu when he gave a keynote for us in Beijing, right? So at least uh, Microsoft has a rich set of managed services all the way to touching uh, non-programmers, right? So uh, 
business analysts and, uh, and business users. So we're also seeing uh, uh, abundance of many, many AI systems. So here, uh, from uh, our perspective, we're way off from general AI, but we're already seeing an explosion in many of these uh, narrow AI systems. So once a year, uh, our friends at Bloomberg Beta create uh, a state of the machine intelligence landscape for us. And uh, uh, this year, they even, uh, had a special section in this uh, landscape map devoted to uh, uh, what seems to be an emerging platform for building these AI applications, right? So you can, uh, you can drill down into uh, sub-communities within the AI space. So here's a similar landscape map we did for uh, intelligent bots. We're in the process of doing one right now for robotics. Um, but as we, uh, as we uh, look at this many narrow AI systems, we're still in the early stages of learning how to evaluate them, how to describe them, uh, what are the right uh, uh, ways of, of comparing these many, many uh, AI applications. So we, we took a stab and looked at, again, uh, by crawling the internet, by and we started to look at what are some of these AI applications that are emerging outside of uh, uh, Silicon ba Valley, right? So we, we noticed, uh, you know, security is one of those spaces that seems to be uh, using many of these technologies. I think a lot of you hear a lot about healthcare as well. Um, and we tried to identify which uh, companies seem to be investing uh, in AI. So mostly using uh, job postings. So I recently asked a friend of mine, so I said, why don't you write a short blog post for me to describe kind of uh, the stack for self-driving cars? So I think it took him like 10 to or 15 pages, right? So, and there were so many diagrams, uh, I couldn't even fit it on the slide, right? So, but uh, one thing that I noticed is that uh, uh, in many of these uh, uh, advanced AI applications, uh, there's a simulation platform. And uh, uh, in this case, if you look in the lower right corner, actually the simulation platform is built on top of Spark, right? Uh, so the idea is, uh, uh, if you want to roll out changes to your AI application, you probably need some platform to simulate how that uh, application will behave in the real world. We're also excited about kind of just uh, hacker projects that we're starting to get. So, um, in fact, some of our most popular uh, uh, articles tend to be more on the, along these lines, right? So it seems like we're, uh, at the stage where hackers who are not necessarily familiar with machine learning can just uh, compose and, uh, and uh, uh, piece together these many, many components and build uh, interesting, uh, interesting uh, narrow AI systems. And so as we uh, deploy many of the systems in mission critical situations, uh, we need tools for, to build reliable and robust uh, AI software. So uh, this is uh, something that I think AmpLab was early to talk about. So in, in the context of machine learning pipelines, so how, do we, how do we build uh, pipelines uh, and estimate error, for example, right? Um, so to the extent that uh, we want uh, programmers to be more productive and uh, be able to build these applications at scale and uh, to have these applications remain reliable and robust, uh, we probably will start seeing tools that use machine learning to help programmers, right? Uh, I don't actually hear that many people talk about this. I, I've heard AmpLab uh, talk about this and uh, Peter Norvig at Google, who's the co-chair of our AI conference, uh, talks a lot about this. Uh, but tools that help programmers become more productive make it easier for them to build uh, these systems in a reliable and robust way. 
So the research community uh, at AI in AI is very active. Uh, so you will see uh, systems that add more and more capabilities, uh, uh, many, many uh, features, including uh, multimodal emotion detection, which is one thing that I'm excited about. But also uh, the, fun, the underlying algorithms are going to be probably different over time, right? Right now we're in the, I think we're in a situation where uh, most of these systems rely on large scale pattern recognition. They require a lot of data, uh, a lot of compute. Uh, so there's uh, definitely a, a group of researchers who are trying to offer alternative uh, approaches. So about a year ago, there were a bunch of books that came out of, about uh, AI safety. So basically positing that uh, general AI is just around the corner, and so therefore uh, uh, we need to start talking about uh, AI safety. Uh, so what we've noticed is uh, more recently, uh, a lot of the discussion uh, has shifted somewhat to more of uh, the economy, economic implications, right? So I guess one of the tragic things about the last election, aside from the result, aside from the result, uh, is that a lot of the discussion tended to be around free trade agreements, but in reality, I think uh, the implications of automation are gonna be more profound. Uh, and uh, we're hearing more and more companies, again, start talking about uh, uh, digital transformation and uh, some of the companies are deep into digital transformation, some are just g getting started, but uh, a lot of that will result in automation. And, and finally, uh, one thing that I, I liked uh, noticing this last uh, year is uh, a lot of interest among our peers in, in the areas of ethics, fairness, and transparency. Uh, so not only do we have books, we've had a lot of, uh, uh, I've seen a lot of people give talks about this at meetups. Uh, we've had a few keynotes at this, about this at Strata plus Hadoop World. But also, uh, I think just generally, people are also interested in even training programs as to how, how they can bring these ideas inside their organizations. So in closing, uh, if you want to learn more, um, come to our events. Uh, here are some references uh, where a lot of these uh, charts and uh, data came from. And uh, congratulations to Amp Lab. So um, I'm not, I'm, I guess I'm not technically a sponsor of Amp Lab, but I've been uh, privileged to be invited to many of the retreats and. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for making me part of the extended AmpLab family. And also thank you for succeeding because it's, uh, it's a great for punditry if you, uh, if you predict something that actually happens. So Ian, make sure Rise succeeds too. Yeah. So if you have any questions, here's my contact information. Thank you.